This evening we will be featuring an interview between Nick Jurgens and his father, Carl Jurgens. Enjoy! Thanks for tuning in to My Story Matters. Hello uh, and welcome to the uh, Your Story Matters education series, or rather My Story Matters, but it's not my story we're talking about here today because I'm uh, conducting an interview with my dad. And so uh, let's begin with uh, your name. My name is Carl Jurgens. All right. And uh, what are three words that you would say best describe you? I would say creative, athletic, and playful. And what's an interesting fact about yourself that others might not know? I think that uh, a lot of people don't know that I practice martial art. Uh, in fact, Taekwondo, and I'm a grandmaster in the form. I also used to do some swimming when I was younger, so a lot of people didn't know about that. And I qualified for the Nationals a couple of times, but... Uh, um, a lot of people don't know that I'm a, I'm a pretty good martial artist, and so they get intimidated and they, they take a step back when, when I tell them about that. But uh, it, it's okay because I'm probably the safest person to have in your midst because I know how to defend a person. And uh, what do you enjoy doing most right now? My time is preoccupied with publishing, writing, and doing public readings, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really enjoy writing, and it's one of my favorites. Perhaps including what you've already said, or perhaps something else, what would you say are your best talents? I would say uh, writing and uh, uh, teaching is one of the good ones, and, and so I, I, I like doing that. And I would say that scintillating semantique is the thing that does the trick, grandiloquent fecundity fills the ear most pleasantly but we all best accentuate when clearly we enunciate. Now, I've heard this one's uh, for polite company, but how old are you? Well, I don't like to admit it because I'm 71. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there's other questions we have here about, uh, about things about yourself, like gender identity. Well, I'm me, <laughs> and, and so I, I'm not sure. Do you mean, if, am I heterosexual or yeah things like that yeah mm -hmm. okay so people call me a him mm -hmm. <laughs> so if, if you're talking pronouns so I'm not sure how to reply to that I, I once went to a conference and they asked me the same kind of question and they said what pronoun do you want to use and I said just call me Carl <laughs> and uh, and where are you living right now I'm living in the city of Windsor mm -hmm. and, uh, and were you born here in Canada I was born in Canada, in Toronto, in the West End, and uh, I, I like Toronto a lot, but it's become far more congested recently, and so I'm, I'm not crazy about my visits there, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and what languages do you speak, perhaps in your time in Toronto and today? Well, I, I, can speak, I, I can speak tourist French, f tourist German, I, I'm quite fluent in Latvian, which is my original background, and uh, English, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm also an English prof. And uh, language was, uh, or sort of, I mean to say Latvian was sort of the language of the home growing up, is that right? Yes, it was. Um, and in fact, I remember my parents used to speak Latvian all the time, and my mom tried to teach me Russian mm -hmm. uh, when I was a little kid, and I, I, I protested and I said, well, why do I have to learn how to speak Russian? And she says, you always need to know the language of your enemy. Mm -hmm. And I went, okay, that makes sense. You know, I didn't like it, but I, 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 I didn't learn it very well. Uh, the next question we have here is, what's the highest level of education you've attained? I, I became a doctor. I have a PhD in uh, English Lit. Mm -hmm. it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a doctor of philosophy, but uh, that's what it is. Yeah. And do you identify with a particular faith or religion? Well, I, I, I have questions about that because I'm undergoing uh, some changes. I was uh, associated with the uh, Latvian church in Toronto, and um, they were Christian, but 
I, I don't necessarily believe in an anthropomorphic God or anything like that. However, I do believe in spiritual spirituality. And I, I have encountered ghosts in the past, including footsteps in leaves. If you want, I can elaborate on that. But uh, I've, I've seen uh, footsteps approaching me uh, in, in the autumn on leaf tops. And one of the footsteps I, I, I calculated would step right before me and it would step right on a stick that had fallen from a, a nearby tree. And it, and it did. And I could see the footstep depressing the leaves and then the twig snapped. That frightened the heck out of me. And then I ran inside and peeked out the window at this, the location. And I could still see the footsteps in the leaves. Um, and when I talked to a tribal elder, he was a Nishnabi, uh, he said, oh yeah, it's just a spirit walker. Don't worry about it, you know? And he says, just, just leave some sweet grass or something like that as a gift just to show that you're aware of them. And so, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So mm -hmm. I, I guess the closest would be uh, a kind of Buddhist f idea. Because it certainly does seem like you uh, take inspiration from a lot of different spiritual perspectives. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. it's true. And uh, now you've touched on this one already, but uh, do you play or follow any sports? Yes, uh, well, I used to do swimming a lot, and uh, I, I like... Uh, I, I played water polo for a while, and it was fun, and uh, of course Taekwondo, it was a mm -hmm. lot of fun, and I enjoyed that very much, and I started a school up in Sault Ste. Marie when I was teaching there, and uh, it went quite well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if I recall, there was uh, one sport that you did that uh, you got on TV for in an ad. That's true, yes. I, 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 was, I was, in connection with my competitive swimming, I joined a group of uh, former swimmers and lifeguards and we were involved with a, a thing called underwater hockey which is played in a swimming pool and you push a, a, a metal puck along the bottom of the pool using a capital I shaped stick that's about this long and you just push it along and it has it has a sort of curved part at the top and so you can aquaplane the puck if you're shooting carefully and we used to pass it back and forth, and we, we, would, we would do all the dirty tricks that water polo players do, which is uh, push, push a person underwater, hang onto their bathing suit, hang onto their flippers, and you wear flippers and masks and snorkels to play the game. And so, yeah, I used to do that, and we, we ended up making a beer commercial as a result for Oki Fail. I mm -hmm. remember that. We yeah. had a lot of fun. Now, uh, to conclude this section of the, uh, the interview questions, are there any other uh, sort of labels or identities you associate with yourself besides, you know, Latvian or Taekwondo instructor, or language professor? Well, I used to be a lifeguard and I used to be a truck driver. I used to be a door-to-door -door salesman for insulation. And so I guess those are identities in a way. And uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a public reader. I do readings in, in public and... I, I do shows and stuff like that, so I don't know if those are counting as identities, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think they, they would maybe be so. Okay, now before we uh, turn to the next category of questions, maybe you could speak a little bit more on your uh, prestigious underwater hockey career and the ad that you had with it. It's hardly prestigious, but yes, it was a very interesting uh, time because we had a, a, a kind of local W.C. Fields type character by the name of Paul Rimstead who helped shoot the ad with us and he had this uh, interesting attitude that would uh, delay uh, the time we were on camera uh, because he was getting paid by the minute and we were we were just walk-ons so we were we had to join ACTRA which was the Association of Canadian Television and Radio Actors in order to do the ad and while we were shooting uh, an ad advert for a beer company um, he would, we would be poised about to drink some ale that had been scooched into by a little uh, air, air bubble maker and so it would look really good and the, the glasses were, were uh, straight out of a freezer and so they were sweating a little bit and it looked really tasty and, and uh, he would say, hey, 
look at the flying turtles and we'd all look up and they'd say cut you can't have that and he would say ha 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 and and then his secretary would go well that's an extra minute you're doing now paul and uh then the next the next cut he would say things like oh your fly's open and we'd all look down <laughs> and and again we were delayed um and so the secretary would make note again and say you know okay we we're we're using up time and then uh we we were smart enough to get residuals on the uh on the beer commercial and so as a consequence of that we we received a lot of money uh because it was a very popular advert at the time and uh we went to Calgary for the Canadian National Championships because we were the best in Ontario we were the Can- the Ontario champs and uh when we got there we had something like 12 cases of free beer and we we tried to get the other team drunk but it, it backfired and so we ended up being drunk ourselves <laughs> because we we kept inviting them up to uh, have drinks and they they were very cagey <laughs> so anyway All right that's the story out there well it's certainly an interesting one yeah now uh it's fun now turning to the category of sort of life history okay. um so what are there any stories you'd like to share about your life history and this can be things about your family or your career or uh community involvement sort of life anecdotes you'd like to share oh sure i got lots of them uh i wouldn't know where to start uh i i remember my my parents were uh immigrants both immigrants from latvia and they they got married and they lived in toronto in the in the west end and um uh, i remember my mom was a caterer and uh uh among other things and she she did the restaurant business uh and my dad was a uh had was forced into being a carpenter because uh they didn't recognize his degrees from the old country and so as a consequence he ended up working on construction and as soon as he opened his mouth on the construction site they disliked him because they recognized that he was a foreigner and uh even though he was a white male uh they would discriminate against him openly and they tried to murder him one time uh by killing him in in an industrial elevator so he was between the bars of the elevator and instead of saying signaling to go up they signaled it to go down and he was crushed by the elevator so lots of stories like that mm-hmm. anyway hardships that they endured because they were immigrants mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and the second part of that question is uh what would you say are the most important things you want people to know about you oh uh, well i i was a publisher for a long time and i did rampike magazine for a long time uh which is a a cool mag and we used to feature international talent from all over the world um artist artists and uh writers and uh theorists it it, it went quite well and i did that for 36 years and so yeah that that was that was an important thing i was also a prof at 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 various universities i taught at five different universities including york u of t um in toronto and uh algoma up in uh, sous st marie and now windsor and i i also taught at some community colleges uh in in the region including uh humber college which was quite fascinating uh so i i spent a lot of time doing teaching and uh so what would you say your living situation was like growing up and sort of as a second part to that what would you say is some of your fonder memories from that time looking back well i remember um we were working class as a result of the uh the inability of canada or the unwillingness of canada to accept my parents degrees both of them were well trained in the old country in latvia but none of their uh credentials were recognized here in Canada and so they ended up uh taking menial jobs as a result and uh but i think the fondest memories were the socializing that was going on and we would have lots of gatherings and people would come over and we'd have cake and uh you know cake for kids was really fun and we we would drink ginger ale and and stuff like that i remember 
we had a good time. So a lot of the socializing was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And that was with neighbors in the community? Neighbors no, it was mostly with the Latvian community, interestingly enough. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, so what would, what would you say has been your greatest adventure? Um, well, I think uh, the, the, the biggest adventures I've had were my travels in the Caribbean and in Europe. Uh, I was able to go to Europe uh, and um, I visited London, Paris. Uh, interestingly enough, in London I met uh, one of my uh, theatre profs from uh, York University in Toronto. Uh, and he was over in London studying theater, mm -hmm. and I remember watching uh, some Shakespeare drama, and um, it, it was a really good time. And I, at one point, I went over to uh, Dusseldorf, which was in Germany, uh, to talk to uh, the famous artist Joseph Beuys, and uh, he he was very friendly. He made me uh, at that time I was not allergic yet to coffee. I have since then become allergic to coffee. Um, but he made me a, a fresh cup of coffee and we talked for a long time about his art and he was uh, an eco-culturalist. And uh, as we parted, he says, do you know Andy? And he meant Andy Warhol. And he says, next time you're in New York, look up Andy and say hi to him from me. And I went, okay, but I never got to see Andy Warhol. And so we ended up, I ended up publishing the uh, interview in, in my magazine, Rampike. So it went quite well, but uh, yeah, I guess those, those were my big adventures. And I, I remember Barbados was a lot of fun too. Mm -hmm. And uh, when was this that you went to Europe? Um, in Europe, I went, uh, I went a couple of times. And um, I think the, the first one was when I was in my early 20s or, or maybe, yeah, early 20s, something like that. Okay. So it was ages ago. Right. Yeah. And uh, sort of a related question, what would you say are some of the most significant events you've been witness to, sort of historical events, you might say? Oh, historical events? Well, I remember 9-11. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember when we were kids in school, there was the Kennedy assassination, which was horrible. And so those are both nasty events. Um, in terms of exciting, uh, positive events, I don't know if I've experienced too many of those. Uh, I, I remember Trudeau getting elected and there was a big landslide victory for him and the Liberals got in and people were very happy about that. Do you mean the first Trudeau or the second one? The first one, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Pierre. Uh, and, and so that was, that was exciting. But uh, since then, I, I think uh, it's been a lot of negativity. Mm -hmm. And like I, I've, I've witnessed what's going on with Ukraine uh, and the Middle East more recently, and I'm, I'm fearful of something might happen in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, are there any other highlights of your life or big moments that you'd like to discuss that we haven't covered yet? Um, highlights? I think, uh, well, I, 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 I did get to interview very many people. Uh, so I, I, I got to publish people like Jacques Derrida, Julie Kristeva, uh, Paul Oster from the United States, uh, top top writers and theorists from around the world, and so and I, I got to talk to a lot of writers across Canada, uh, and so that was that was really exciting for me. Mm -hmm. Those were the the best things I think. Yeah, and I believe uh, you may have briefly interviewed Hunter S. Thompson. Is that right? Yeah. Well, Hunter S. Thompson was supposed to be interviewed by him by me. But he never made it to Toronto because his son was caught in a, a, an accident in, I think it was Colorado or someplace, and so he never showed up. Mm. But I, I was able to interview a lot of other super famous people. Right. Yeah, so, and that was for my mag, Rampike. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. To close out this category, um, is there anything that you wish you had done earlier in life? Or alternatively, something that you ha did do that you wish you hadn't? Oh, um, well, I wanted to learn how to dance better, <laughs> you know, because I'm, I'm not a very good dancer. And I think that with my martial art training, I probably could have learned it quite well. And I know that you're a very good pianist, but uh, I, I, I stopped music uh, quite, quite a long time ago. And I, it's one of the things I wished I would have maintained. You know, mm -hmm. like saxophone and piano and stuff like that. Right. 
So, uh, yes, as I was saying, this next category is a little bit more positive, and it's about uh, gratitude. Uh, so what are some things that you're thankful for? Well, I'm, I'm grateful that I was born at a good time in life in the 20th century because um, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> and I know it's not all about fun, but there are also opportunities. And uh, it was not that difficult to get work. And I, I think it's more competitive now because there are far more people on the planet at the moment uh, than there used to be when I was a kid. So I was born in a very good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And uh, what are you most proud of in life? Well, apart from your achievements, I would say um, I, I did a pretty good job with uh, my magazine, Rampike, and yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, let's take a look at them. Yeah, and, and I used to feature uh, some pretty top name artists on the covers. This one is a Noel Harding cover, and he was the uh, uh, artist in artist in residence, distinguished artist in residence at University of Windsor. Mm -hmm. And just by coincidence, I used to study with him at the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. And uh, he ended up getting a, a, a job at the uh, University of Windsor. And um, he was uh, he was the head of the the art, art school there when I was applying for my first position as department head of the English department mm -hmm. uh, back then. And this is a Carl Beam cover. Uh, he, he's an indigenous artist from Manitoulin Island. He's passed away since. So I was very happy to be able to feature him. And this one, I noticed uh, this is uh, Chief Sitting Bull and that's Albert Einstein down here. And it was part of his art piece. And I noticed that uh, the shapes on here were very Latvian. And it, it struck me because this is the, uh, the symbol for the uh, morning star mm -hmm. or the sun. And I, it, 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 it blew my mind that, uh, well, it probably shouldn't have because there are only so many geometric possibilities one can achieve with uh, a weaving. But it kind of blew my mind that uh, they had arrived, indigenous people of North America had arrived at the same uh, shapes as uh, the Latvian people. And I've always found an affinity with indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, anyway. the, and I noticed that issue there is an earlier issue in a different shape than the other two. So yes. It, why is that? Back in the day, uh, I started it like this because the medium is the message, and I used to study with Marshall McLuhan, among other people. And uh, so I, I thought, well, how can we make the medium a little bit different? And so what we did was we used to make sure that the, the print uh, was uh, following a tall page. Uh, because it would fit poetry very nicely, but um, ever since then, the uh, they 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 said well, the big box stores said they didn't want to feature that. They, they said it didn't fit on their bookshelves that well, and so they said well you got to go back to a normal format like this, and uh, so we so we did, and they, then they wanted a barcode on the back, and so you know it was it just became a an exercise in commercialization. I kept the mag going for quite a bit longer after that, but uh, I was dismayed because when it used to be this shape, uh, it always sold out. But this shape, it was in competition with other mags like Time Magazine, you know, and like uh, this one, and this one fit perfectly on the back of your toilet seat so you could read it while you were using the toilet. And so I, I planned it that way on purpose, but uh, that's the way the world cookie crumbles, you know? Mm -hmm. the, world, the world asked us to change, and yeah, we did. And uh, so what are some things that bring you joy in life? Well, uh, apart from your personal successes and my Thank family successes, uh, uh, family and uh, writing, I think, uh, writing and publishing uh, make me happy. Mm -hmm. So. That makes sense, given you've done them both for so long. Yeah, uh, yeah. old habits die hard. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, maybe you can impart us with some life lessons. So what would you say gives your life uh, meaning or some purpose? Well, I would say helping others is really important and uh, contributing to uh, the making the world a better place, which is a hard, tall order now. It's a hard thing to do. 
because we've got climate change, we've got warfare, open warfare in Ukraine, we've got uh, open warfare in the Middle East, so I'm not exactly sure how to proceed with that. Um, those, those kind of major problems used to be there, but we always found a resolution for them. Nowadays, I'm not so sure we can find a resolution, so I, I don't know. It, it, it worries me. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, along that same line, what would you say is the best advice you've ever been given? I, I, I remember an artist saying, art is art, everything else isn't. And uh, I like to think about it in terms of uh, the golden rule, which is uh, popular among many cultures and that is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And would you say that's a favorite uh, motto of yours? Well, it's something I like to practice. I don't know if I, I, I use it as a motto that much, but uh, it's something that I, I, I like to uh, live by. Mm -hmm. Would you say that you do have a motto of some kind? I, I think uh, helping others, and if somebody asks me to give them a hand with something, I, I rarely refuse. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've always built my experience based on uh, helping others achieve their goals. Right. And I think that makes me happy too, because mm -hmm. it makes the world a better place, etc. Yeah. And I guess that follows in well into our next question, which is uh, with life lessons. What's something that you've learned about life that you want to pass along to others? Well, it sounds like a cliche, and I think the Beatles sang a song about it, and it's all you need is love. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, sometimes it's that simple, eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turning to another category, um, which is about dealing with challenges in life. Yes. So how would you say you get through tough times, or where do you find comfort during those tough times? Uh, well, I, I, um, I have found that uh, community helps a lot. Like, uh, who you're socializing with can make a big difference, so... Uh, relying on friends and friendship and stuff like that really makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And sort of uh, in the same way that there's tough times, you know, we all have uh, usually losses in life. So is there anything that you'd like to say on losses you may have experienced and how to deal with that? Well, I've experienced a lot of deaths uh, and uh, uh, a lot of my family got wiped out during the Second World War. and. Latvia was basically a doormat for Europe and it was invaded by the Germans, it was invaded by the Russians and so we fought all the juggernauts, you know, all the big ones mm -hmm. and you know they had force brothers who were resisting uh, even after the war was over and we, we begged the West for help, none of it came. So that was that was a, a, a eye-opener, you know, and uh, uh, we've got lots of uh, glo global problems right now, but I, I think that uh, in terms of uh, uh, response to such things, meditation and exercise help a lot. So, like, I, I would just exercise mm -hmm. my way through such things. Yeah, sort of work off steam in a way. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So, for current affairs, for you personally, uh, things that are happening right now, or is there anything that you, you would say you're struggling with? So well, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's the problem with climate change, and that that concerns me, and I think everybody, I think that's everybody's problem. And then there's the Middle East, and then there's the Ukraine problem, and then there's the the China syndrome with Taiwan and all that stuff. So I'm I'm not sure what to make of all this stuff, and there's a lot of tension on the planet right now. I think that uh, there's a lot of hatred being spread, uh, and it's unfortunate, and I, I don't think it's very conducive to people getting along. Uh, it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's like the saying, uh, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but uh, you know, what, what's uh, local is global in a way. So even yeah. though they're global problems, though they're, those, are, those are things that seem to concern you personally. Yeah, well, you can act locally, but you can, you, you, and so indirectly, your local actions can affect globally. And I heard the Dalai Lama say one time that uh, if everybody were to meditate on world peace for about 15 minutes every day, we would have world peace. But I don't think everybody meditates on that because I don't see Putin 
putting time aside, 15 minutes a day, to uh, meditate on world peace. And I don't see Xi from uh, China doing the same thing either. And so, and I, I certainly don't see, you know, Hamas and Israel doing meditations of that sort either. You know, so like, it's just, it's just heck out there. Now, um, now this next question here is related to that of uh, what personal strengths help you get through uh, times like those that you've described. Uh, but I feel like you've already discussed that in some ways with um, with meditation and things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that and perseverance and optimism. Optimism helps a lot. So, like, if you're optimistic about the way things are going to go, you, you you really don't have a choice. I mean, you really got to be optimistic in in the world today, you know, because otherwise it becomes horribly depressing. Like your your mind can just run away. And you can you can find yourself in a very negative space all very quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like maintaining an optimistic attitude is really hard to do, but it's really important too. And now I found the wording of that question interesting: personal strengths. Because I remember one time you told me a story about uh, how praying for strength can backfire sometimes. Do you remember that? Yeah, like if you pray for strength, um, you can get. Uh, hardships facing you that make you stronger but it's not a really great idea uh, so praying for the strength to overcome uh, a different crisis you might be handed a, another crisis you know just to see if you can build your strength mm -hmm. like build your psychological muscles in order to uh, cope with such problems so yeah i think you're right yeah mm -hmm. or maybe i was right <laughs> way back then yeah i'm quoting I, you after all yeah I, I heard that one from, uh, uh, I think, an indigenous elder who said, well, don't pray for strength because it, it might backfire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, out of your personal struggles with things like uh, sort of growing up in a kind of working class poverty or with all these tough international issues, would you say there's any good that's come out of these difficult experiences? Oh, sure, yeah. You learn a lot and uh, you gain a lot of patience. Uh, and the thing I have found ab about myself as time has passed on is that I've gained a lot more patience with with uh, all these negative experiences. You know, you, you just you just get used to stuff and and like drives you crazy. And I like, for example, I've had troubles with the telephone company, and uh, I would call them up and. I would try not to get too angry at them because the person at the other line is just a worker hired to take care of the uh, the crisis and yeah they do some crisis management but it's not their job to fix the whole dang company you know and so they cannot they cannot do that and so you, you just learn patience you just go you, you pass on the uh, information that you need to pass on and uh, I think that's what I've learned. Right. And so, along the same lines with uh, these worldly affairs and personal struggles, how would you say they've affected your priorities or your passions? Um, hmm. Well, uh, priorities and passions, I would say, um, have shifted a little bit because I used to be more self-centered and now I'm more community-centered I think mm -hmm. uh, you know to be completely honest and uh, I, I, I find it makes me very happy when I hear of other people finding success or former students finding success and yourself finding success uh, so that makes me happier because I know the world is becoming a better place you know mm -hmm. a little bit at a time and so for this next question, I'll focus a bit on, uh, on the Cold War experience or growing up in the Cold War. Yes. Because that seems like it was quite formative. So uh, how would you say your life had changed or uh, how it might have changed you growing up in that environment? Well, we were terrified. We thought we were going to die every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids at school, there was a, a doomsday clock that they used to publish in the local newspaper in Toronto and the the doomsday clock would be like five minutes to midnight and then four minutes to midnight and then three minutes to midnight and then one minute from midnight and we thought we were all gonna die 
we thought we were all going to get burned up in a in a nuclear blast. And I remember the public school teachers used to make us hide under our desks as if that would have made any difference, you know. And we were we were teasing the kids that sat along the windows because we said you're going to die first and they would they all start crying and 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 you know it was just a horrible thing to do and i remember hiding under the desk and you'd see bubble gum and graffiti down there and uh because people would stick their gum under the desks and yeah and the cold war was really formative because you get used to the idea of death as an omnipresent thing and you just go well, you got to learn to live with that. You know, it's just one of those things, mm -hmm. and uh, and so far so good. You know, we made it to seventy one, and you know, nobody's blown me up yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel a little bit like the guy that jumped out of a high rise building, you know, and he's falling to his death, and and some some interviewer asks him, so how's it feel so far? And he goes, so far, so good. <laughs> right, yeah. It's like, it's like the old saying, uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, I guess that uh, sort of is the takeaway then, that you sort of learned to live through adversity and to not uh, hyperfixate on things outside of your control. Yeah, well, you, you adopt a kind of stoicism uh, because if you can't change it yourself, there's no sense getting excited about it, and you learn how not to... Uh, get too involved emotionally with things that you cannot change, simply cannot change. And so you, you, you learn to uh, just adapt to them instead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, looking toward the future instead now, uh, when you look forward, what would you say are some hopes and dreams, you know, some aspirations that you have to look well, forward to now? I used to think about uh, a thing that I learned from Indigenous people, which was the seventh fire, mm -hmm. uh, which, which meant... You look down the road about seven generations in order to see how you can make the world uh, respond to the needs of the seventh generation down the road. But now I've, I've shrunk that to fewer generations because I'm a little bit concerned because of climate change and uh, global crises of different wars in different parts of the planet. And uh, I see rampant greed from large corporations which really upset me and so I think we're going to be lucky to get to the seventh fire mm. the seventh generation if you want to call it that right yeah and uh so but in the meantime what would you say are three goals that anyone could take away for health and happiness um well I think it's really important to uh be patient to be optimistic and to exercise because uh, if you don't exercise is actually the fountain of youth and it'll keep you in good condition uh, I know other I have other friends who have not exercised very much in their lives and uh, they've they've gained a lot of weight you know they're they're kind of uh, not healthy you know and and they're on different kinds of pills and I'm very proud of the fact that I I'm not on any pills at all mm -hmm. right now. And so I think that's probably because that I exercised. I did a lot of competitive swimming and then I did martial art for many years. And uh, lately I ride my bike and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I work out every, every single day. Uh, I try to anyway, at least for a short while. Right. Yeah, so I think it's really important to uh, exercise and maintain your body because Healthy mind is a healthy body, you know, and like, so you exercise your mind as well. Right. Yeah. Now for your uh, imminent future, I guess we could call it, uh, where would you like to, what would you like to see differently, perhaps about yourself or about uh, the world situation in a month or even in half a year or six months? Well, yeah, six months from now, I would like to see world peace become a, a, a possibility or a reality, but I, I'm, I'm sort of leery that it might not happen, you know, mm -hmm. so like I'm a little bit concerned about that. I'm also concerned about climate change and uh, I'm a little bit worried about uh, the fact that we may get another plague, mm -hmm. you know, and, and 
the U.S. government dismantled all of Barack Obama's uh, system of dealing with plague, um, even though he had it set up ahead of time, you know, and then, like, it would have been really helpful <laughs> during COVID, you know, and, you know, to have that, that system in place, but it was dismantled mm -hmm. by the then president of the United States. Right. So, and I, I, I'm, I'm worried about, you know, I won't mention any names, but uh, I think everybody knows who I mean, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about such things, you know, like, can we stay healthy? Can we, can we live in peace? You know, can mm -hmm. we take care of each other? Is world hunger going to be a problem? Is climate change going to be a problem? Probably, yeah, but can we cope with it? Mm -hmm. I think if we're, we're very creative people, and we might be able to cope with it. All right. Well, uh, as we are starting to reach the end of the interview here, one other story that I was hoping that you would share with us is uh, regarding the big Coca-Cola plaque we have in the room with us here and how you might have gotten that. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, a cousin of mine came to Toronto, and she was fresh from Australia. She, she was our, our uncle, uh, who you may know, uh, extended family because many of our people died in the World War and uh, she was part of that extended family so she came over to visit me in Toronto and we went to the Canadian National Exhibition and there was a, a, a place where you could shoot BB guns at, at targets and uh, I, I not only took out my target I was able to take out the target of the fellow beside me because he was, all the targets were lined up on a clothesline at the, at, at the, in a, in a short shooting gallery. And I think that the guns were made so that you couldn't shoot accurately. And um, nonetheless, I was able to figure out uh, whether my gun pulled left or right. And, and I, I knocked out the, the circle that I was supposed to knock out. And uh, as a consequence, because I knew how to shoot effectively, I was able to knock out the fellow beside me's uh, little little gizmo, and it, it worked out really well because we we won the Coca Cola mirror for myself, and he won uh, he also won a, a Pepsi Cola mirror for himself, and uh, the the carnival fella was really upset about this and said, "Hey." I can't afford to keep giving away mirrors, you know, like this. Uh, you know, they're really expensive. And uh, I went to him. I said to him, well, wait a minute. You just, we just won two mirrors. That's going to draw a big crowd. People are going to be paying their money to use your service here. And so why don't you just advertise that? And, and he, he thought about it and he went, yeah, that's a good idea. And so we ended up with the, uh, the Coca-Cola mirror as a result. Right. So it was interesting. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you managed Grand Pike for a very long time as its editor and publisher, and you've written a few other novels. Uh, so what are you working on recently that you could tell the audience about? So I'm, uh, I had a, a book of short stories that came out recently, uh, just last year, and it, it did quite well. It won the uh, Forward Prize, uh, which I was quite pleased with. Uh, it was a finalist for that. It didn't win the, win the prize outright, but it was a finalist. And that was assembled by the librarians across Canada. And so that made me very happy. Uh, and it, it also won a bronze uh, prize for the category of short, short fiction uh, for the ELIT Awards, Electronic Literature. So it was also simultaneously released as a print book and as an electronic book. Um, currently, I have uh, an offer to publish some of my poetry, and I, I assembled a whole bunch of poems only because I was looking for uh, some material that I could release as a, as, a, as a book, and I'm currently working on a novel, but I thought in between I can maybe uh, release a, a poetry book because when I searched my files, I found that I had more than enough material for an entire book. And uh, so I, c I could read a, a, a short poem, if you like. It's this one, this one's called Words. We speak words. Distant galaxies cannot hear our intonations. Distances mean little. Kilometers or meters reduced to six feet. 
perhaps a bit more, this meter time. How far apart are we now? We speak utter measured meters. Our rhythms speak distances. We know the space between us is immeasurable, immediate. So I've got a bunch of poetry like that. And uh, so as I say, Exile Editions is uh, accepting that uh, publication uh, in book format uh, come later this year. And I'm also the editor of uh, Ellipse Magazine, which does translations, um, mostly French, English. And uh, I've been invited to talk at uh, McGill University for two talks and also to Yale University for two talks. So I'm pretty happy about that kind of stuff. And I'm getting articles published here and there uh, through, through uh, scholarly publications such as Studies in Canadian Literature, etc. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that. And uh, what's the title of your most recent book and where might people buy it? Um, well, it hasn't been released yet, uh, but it, it, the title tentatively, the working title is Travesties, <laughs> which I think is an amusing title because it breaks all the rules. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, before we conclude, uh, are there any closing thoughts or anything else you'd like to add for this interview? I, I think that's, that's about it. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this interview. Uh, I'm Nick Jurgens. This has been Carl Jurgens, uh, my dad, sharing his uh, life stories and experiences with us. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you once again for joining us for My Story Matters. I'm Lois Rindlisbacher, and it was nice to hear from Nick and his father, Carl Jurgens. See you next week on My Story Matters. And thank you always to New Horizon for Senior Program for making this happen.